The following program contains material that may be disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. Making, making contact. Making, contact. Making, making, making contact. I'm Anita Johnson, and this week on Making Contact. The youngest patient that I lost was 20 years old which was devastating for me because that's not my patient population. And I have children of that age. A lot of people are dealing with things that they may not want to talk about. To your friends, to your family, to your coworkers, they just don't want to discuss it. There have been um, moments where um, suicide did, in fact, came into, into my mind. And I have had to try to um, I bypassed that by focusing on my daughter. Today on the show, we'll hear from people who have been struggling to keep patients alive in the emergency room, striving to find work, and trying to balance parenthood during the pandemic. We begin with Amy Arland, a registered nurse at the COVID-19 unit at the Kaiser Permanente Fresno Medical Center. Amy, considered a seasoned medical professional, had never experienced anything quite like COVID. When you work 20 years in an ICU, you build up a level of knowledge and experience. You're considered an expert because you've taken care of the same kinds of patients for so long. You know your stuff. And with COVID, it just threw a monkey wrench in all of that. We didn't know anything. And it was very frustrating and very scary because you don't know what's coming through the door every day and not every COVID patient is the same. Treatments were constantly changing and in the nursing field, especially in ICU, emergency rooms and very high stress areas where patients are always in crisis, um, we learned to adapt to change very rapidly. But with COVID, the changes were minute by minute, second by second. Guidelines were all over the place. We didn't know who to trust because everything changed on a dime. Keeping up with all the rapidly changing information about COVID was hard enough for Amy and her colleagues. But by the time the third wave of infections hit Fresno, California, Amy's COVID unit was completely overwhelmed. By that point, we were at 100% ICU mortality for our COVID patients. We were losing them all. And that was the biggest kick in the gut for us because we were throwing everything to the kitchen sink at these people. It's why, why isn't this stuff working? This was death on a massive scale. I mean, we went from an average of maybe two to three deaths a month in our ICU to having 23 deaths a month. Uh, I stopped counting after about the 175th death. Due to the rising number of COVID deaths and the ICU consistently being short-staffed, the responsibility of body disposal regularly fell on Amy. My patients, when they would die, would be in the middle of the night. And we did not have ancillary staff. We had no staff. We were short-staffed most of the time to bare bones, barely scraping by. So I would have to be the one to take that patient um, down to the morgue. And when the morgue was full, we had to take them outside to a refrigerated truck. And we would be stacking them like cordwood. As of August 2021, an average of more than 700 people per day continue to die of COVID-19 in the U.S., Many healthcare workers, like Amy Arland, continue to be overloaded by caring for COVID-19 patients. Globally, COVID-19 has presented unique challenges, leading to increased mental health issues among healthcare workers. There were many nights that um, I didn't think I could go back and do it again. You know, you only are responsible for two patients as an ICU nurse, and when you lose them both in one night, after you've given everything you've got and you really start to feel like what you do is pointless. Um, There were many times that I almost called it quits. I didn't think that I could do this anymore. I could be a nurse anymore. Um, I reached a really low point where I started to resent everybody. I hated my patients. I hated the people I worked with. (laughs) You know, it was a pretty miserable few months when we hit our third surge. Um, And I said, if I survive this surge, that's it, I'm done. Deja Maynard is a licensed clinical social worker based in North Carolina. She offers perspective on the realities of trauma and grief. It is 
pretty much inconceivable, right, to imagine that she, you know, in particular, and all of the other, you know, uh, healthcare frontline workers who decided to, you know, push through, you know, we're still pushing through, it would be inconceivable for them to, to develop any kind of resiliency to sort of all of the, um, all of the things that make such a, such a situation like this distressing to continue their work. And I think in this particular, um, with this particular situation, you know, PTSD is about, you know, it's a, it's a trauma response in that the brain cannot be certain that any situation that is like that sort of initial trauma, that original sort of entry point of that trauma isn't, you know, is actually different. So your your brain and your body is responding as if the trauma is still ongoing. And in this particular instance, right, the length of the pandemic is kind of like this uh, subsequent re-traumatization, right? Like, this person is constantly in the same situation um, that, you know, causes sort of those initial trauma wounds. And so I think that trying to, trying to do our best as those outside of it, you know, this is kind of, we're sort of splitting the difference here because I am a therapist, but doing our best to try to, to try to understand, you know, sort of the depth and breadth of that is kind of where that that empathy and that support, you know, that, that genuine empathy and support, I think, can come from, you know, where we can really sort of make it okay for people to talk about their grief, right? The grief is immense. We understand grief absolutely when people pass away. But I mean, I, I often talk with my clients about needing to grieve expectations too. The loss of a safety net, you know, recognizing that, before they could save most people to realizing that most people, you know, they're not going to be able to save. That is an in and its own necessitates its own grief process. I was staying with some friends that, you know, renting the room out to me and my family and we stayed there for a while. But once things started shutting down due to COVID, they were getting scared themselves. So they basically gave us a month to move out. That's Derek, a pseudonym. He, his wife, and child found themselves homeless at the start of the pandemic. I couldn't find a place within the city, the area, or even the state that I could literally move to. Um, so I had to literally move out of state. And because I had to move out of state, I had to quit my job. I couldn't continue to drive back and forth, you know, from another state eight hours away just to get to work. I mean, even though there were a few places that were hiring, for almost every job I applied to, I got denied work. So it just made a bad situation worse. Before experiencing homelessness, Derek worked at Amazon in California. Then COVID hit, and the little bit of security he had was stripped away. In an attempt to locate affordable housing and greater job opportunities, he moved his family to Nevada, where the cost of living was cheaper. My first big, my my first big concern was trying to find housing. Um, um, that's where I ended up, where I'm at now, which is the um, budget suites. Um, it's like a hotel, but um, they rent either weekly or monthly. This particular place do bi-weekly or monthly. And I and I mean I like this campus better than where I was staying at before. Um but now it's like trying to it find work which um was difficult during the pandemic cuz there were quite literally no place hiring. And and um casinos were shut down. Um, so a lot more people were going on, uh, unemployment. I mean, it did literally at one point, the unemployment rate in the state reached 30%. Very recently over the last month, you know, it, it has dropped back down to below, uh, 10%. 
So I'm I'm still trying to be hopeful. Since relocating to Nevada, Derek has had some successes. He found housing and was able to get some temporary assistance. But he has run into other challenges, trying to navigate complex social service systems. I feel grateful for being able to get what we've been able to get. Um, and it's funny, after talking to lots of people in and out of the um you know, government assistance sector and so forth. A lot of times they have said, you know, it's very easy for a woman and a child to be able to get assistance, but to include a man, it's not quite so easy because lots of times they can, they think or consider that the man should be able to go out and get a job. Which for me, that really put a lot more pressure upon me I have to be the person to find work. I have to be able to provide for the family. And hearing that my daughter and wife would be better off without me felt um, it has a particular type of sting as far as how men are being supported. It's like I know for I me mean, for a while, you know, there's women's rights and women's empowerment and things are quite unfair for women, but just doesn't mean you got to make things unfair to men to help support women. Um, I mean, I'm a man. I'm trying to support women. You know, I have a daughter. I have a wife. I'm trying to do the best that I can to be able to support them. But, you know, I am limited with what I'm able to do at this moment, and I need assistance. And assisting me is assisting these women as well. But in this situation with, you know, losing his job during this period of devastation for many people, depending on what the logistics of their home was, but this could be many of us, you know, in these types of situations. Carrie Mackey Sr. is a psychiatry specialist. He offers perspective on feelings of hopelessness and vulnerability. This is common, you know, um, and I think what we need to understand, not only as, uh, you know, as people of color and, and men, but, you know, as a people in general, that people go through stuff and that it is okay not to be okay at times. I think we have this built up foundational structure around, around us of, resiliency and feeling like, you know, we can't have any weakness. We can't have any moments of, uh, of fragility, but that's not the case for many people. You know, we have to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, to kind of make those efforts to reach out and try to seek assistance. And I think, you know, what was so demeaning in all of this was the fact that, you know, he put his pride to the side, you know, as a man that was a provider for his family and reached out for help. And then as a family, they were told that, oh, it would be better off if you weren't married, essentially, because more would be afforded to your wife and your child. Essentially, they said that we could take care of your family better than you could take care of your family. And that would in itself is demeaning. That would in itself is the is is the the probably one of the most in one of the easiest things that could make a man that is primarily the provider in his household to feel hopeless. I keep trying to keep my head up because I'm um, I'm afraid of having doubts. Uh, at times, I feel like um, when um, whenever I do have a doubt something bad happens. I feel like it comes in a form of, um, you know, if you start thinking it, it happens. So I want to feel optimistic, like, you know, the, the best is going to come and the best is just right there on the edge. And I know it's not that far, but it becomes difficult in, in seeing it being there. Um, but I have faith that it's there and 
um, it's just a struggle in trying not to be so negative minded and putting myself back in a sad position and, and feeling sadness and being sad and, and being doubtful. I mean, it's a, it's a struggle. You're listening to Life During COVID on Making Contact. To stay up to date with our shows and get more information about the people profiled in this week's episode, visit Radio Project. Dot org. Now back to Life During COVID on Making Contact. For most parents, balancing children and a career can be stressful. For some, simple everyday issues can become magnified and seemingly insurmountable. For parents like Shanette Jackson, Anxieties were heightened while balancing both work and parenthood during the pandemic. I was taking my Zoom call from my phone for this particular meeting because I had to pick up books from my children's school. And so I'm on my call with executive staff and, and some other members of my team, and I'm thinking that I'm muted, I, well, I muted myself, and I told, was telling my children to put their shoes on because we had to run out and go pick up their books. And so my son kept asking me, why? Where are we going? Why do I have to go? I'm like, just put on your shoes. And I'm just like trying to whisper to him, just put on your shoes so we can go. And he kept repeating while I'm in this meeting. And at some point during this call, as I was moving around, I unmuted myself. And I did not know. And so he asked me one more time and I said, can you please go put on your blankety shoes? Thank you. And my boss says, um, Jeanette, you know the mute button works, right? And I was like, oh, God, Lord have mercy. I would say that was the height of my anxiety right there, that moment. I was thrown into an instant like, oh, Lord have mercy. Um, my whole team just heard me blankety blank at my kids. <laughs> and... That was really embarrassing. And so the, the funny thing about it, though, so I was really embarrassed. I was completely stressed out and thoroughly embarrassed by it. I got several text messages and emails that were like, that was like the best thing ever. I, they, people were like so act, like really happy to hear me be a human being, like to be normal. Um, someone emailed me was like, that was like the realest thing that I've heard all week. It was like the best thing that I've heard because a lot of us, we're dealing with the same thing, but I just happened to be the one that got caught, like really kind of barking and like snapping. And one, it helped people go, yes, I'm not the only one, but two, it actually helped me realize like, you're going to have to um, exercise more patience with these children because if you said anything to them that you didn't want your team to hear, then you shouldn't say it to them at all. You know what I'm saying? So it actually kind of put me in a place to where I was going to have to be a lot more understanding um, towards them because we were in this together and I didn't want it to be a negative experience of just like our anxieties bouncing off of each other the whole time we were at home. That would be disastrous for the children. It would be disastrous for me as a mother. It would be an epic fail. Um, so I, I think at that, that was the point and the height of my anxiety where I realized that I had to change the paradigm. I had to really rethink how I was going to proceed with homeschooling and balancing out my work and my children's lives, um, to be a more balanced, emotionally balanced mother for them to not turn this into like the worst year of their life. <laughs> For a lot of industries, for a lot of professionals, this pandemic has really, like, the kind of ethos is that people are to become superhuman. Licensed clinical social worker Deja Maynard offers insight about Jeanette's situation and the all-too-familiar challenge of juggling kids and work during the pandemic. So, you know, if you're 
you're working from home and that's also where you're parenting and all these other things your human is showing up you know <laughs> should almost be expected and instead it's kind of like oh my gosh people are are sort of like been people are in a position to be embarrassed by that and so I feel like that's sort of where my mind initially came up that there's just just this weird um uh kind of like uh, juxtaposition about how human the pandemic has kind of made us made us realize that we are or it's kind of forced us to be so to speak juxtaposition to this like you know you gotta do more you should be available you should you know like all of these kind of like internal narratives about what we should be doing and how we should be handling it and that ultimately turning into you know some pretty unrealistic expectations for people so that's kind of the first piece the second piece though like specific to that profound insight that the you know this person had like you know it read like sort of her encouraging herself to do a little bit more probing like probing deeper like well what is it about this that made me embarrassed and and realizing that it's literally about i wouldn't want anyone to know that i talk to my kid like that it seems like it really set up the circumstances for her to consider how her child is there impacted and encourage her to make a change and i think that that is phenomenal i'd be like i you know if if she was sort of my client, I'd be praising her not only for the grace that she's extending, but also for her willingness to, to sort of like take ownership of what's happening. For many parents, the struggle to incorporate their new normal and meet realistic parenting expectations was a challenge. Therapist Deja Maynard. I think a lot of people might had already kind of had some ideas about how they could improve maybe their work-life balance or, you know, their boundaries around uh, work as to how it, it's impacting their family. I mean, I think the, the pandemic, or at least it's been in my experience, the pandemic really uh, exploded people's concerns around that because there wasn't any, any more like strict demarcation between like when you're at home and when you're at work in the ways that, you know, you had previously been able to, to encourage people to use that as that kind of like signaling, right? Like when you hit the door from coming home from your office, you're in mommy mode and it's okay to leave everything behind. But really, you know, if the kitchen table became your office too, as as well as where your kids, you know, where you have dinner with your kids or wherever, those strategies no longer worked. And so I, I would say people really kind of struggled with sort of feeling like they just were not doing a good job because they did not know how. And I would just encourage people like you would not know how. <laughs> so we could work together to create some realistic expectations. Over the course of the pandemic, many people were trying to figure out their new normal. For many, the unknowns were humbling and caused people like Derek to reflect on what's most precious in life. I want to be a man that stands up and works and help provide and, and be there for his family. I want to be in my daughter's life, not just a man that says I want to be in the daughter's life and have to fight for, uh, you know, um, visiting and, and so forth and have custody and blah, blah, blah. I'm not trying to separate from my wife neither. Derek has worked the majority of his adult life. When married in 2017, he was the sole provider for his family. However, the past couple of years have been rocky with unstable employment and a range of health problems. And to complicate the situation further, Derek has sickle cell anemia. And due to a torn meniscus, his wife now depends on a walker to get around. Together, they are trying to earn a living, care for each other and their child, but it hasn't been easy. I'm trying to be a man that stands there and holds the hand of his wife and child and be in their life and work to continue to be able to try to put food on the table. And at the moment, I'm unable to. So, yes, I am also relying upon the government to help assist me with that as well. I just pray for us to um, be able to survive. I, I, I mean, I, I pray on everything, just praying and praying and praying and which, you know, hoping that something would come around on Because it, it just really happened tough. It's rough, man. I might need a therapist, man. I can't front. Asantawa Boykin 
is a registered ER nurse in Sacramento, California. I don't think that I have, as someone who's been on the front line, has has been intentional about unpacking the trauma of last year. Um, I would encourage that, that anyone will go about doing that, but there are moments where I'm just like, F- one, F- I lived. Um, <laughs> two, oh my God, nobody close to me died from this. F- and like it, it, it's a waiver between feeling grateful and guilty. Um, and feeling like I, you know, thrown away and also praised at the same time. Like, oh my God, you're a hero. Like, but why wouldn't you wear masks though? So people didn't get sick, right? Uh, so yeah, no, I might have to go see a, a therapist for myself specifically, but not today. Asantawa's expressed emotions of survivor's remorse aren't uncommon. Clinical therapist Deja Maynard. People are often conditioned to consider how much worse someone else has it. And while I think that there's some admirable <laughs> kind of like motivations behind that, you know, you're you're hoping to teach people to become more empathetic, you know, become less self-centered. What ultimately is happening, or at least what I often find to be happening is people are invalidating their own emotional experiences as a result of thinking about how much worse someone else has it. And I, and so as such, I'm like, Yes, it, it it might be different for someone else, but that does not mean that you're not feeling any less of what you're feeling. The pandemic has forced us to face harsh realities, and no one has been closer to the heartbreak and pain caused by COVID than our frontline workers, like Amy Arland, the RN from Fresno we heard from earlier. The breakthrough moment for me was um, one of my therapists, and I swear I'll, I'll be with him forever, is just teaching me... Um, I don't even know. I think the biggest part of it was learning how to get past the fear. Um, You know, fear is the mind killer. It's the one thing that really holds so many people back from doing the things that they need to do in their lives. And I lived in so much fear all of the time that it was what he called radical acceptance. I had to learn to get past the fear and find my courage to keep going. For Making Contact, I'm Anita Johnson reporting from Berkeley, California. been listening to Life During COVID on Making Contact. Thanks to all the participants and experts who contributed to this week's episode. If you suspect that you or someone you know may be struggling with anxiety or depression, contact the National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-HELP. If you've enjoyed this episode, Please write and review us twice on Apple Podcasts. And then please share with your friends and family via Facebook, Twitter, and on Instagram. We're Making Contact Project. To learn more about us and access other episodes for free, visit us at radioproject.org. The Making Contact team includes the Executive Director, Sonia Green, Monica Lopez, Salima Himarani, Sabine Blazin, and I'm Anita Johnson. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. Reverend Al Sharpton is one of America's most renowned civil rights leaders with over 40 years experience as a community leader, politician, and minister. KPFA with Marcus Books will present Reverend Al, who will discuss his timely new book, Rise Up, Confronting a Country at a Crossroads. Michael Eric Dyson says this man is a gift from God to the world. His book is a gift from Al Sharpton to us. Let's appreciate them both. Reverend Sharpton will be in a KPFA Zoom event on Thursday, October 21st, starting at 7 p.m. Pacific Time. Greg Bridges, hip-hop and social affairs veteran, will host this exceptional event. For tickets, just go to kpfa.org and scroll down.
You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.